Hey everybody, just wanted to do a quick preview of kind of where the new rules are sitting. A couple of things here that um, don't really apply for the next set of rules, but at least you're going to be able to have a quick look at where the rule set's kind of at right now. So if we move up here, I'm just going to take a look at uh, our counter units. So this is preparing the next next section for the Battle of Astrakhazi. So as you can see, I've got the SD unit, which is my static defense unit, broken up into two lances. Um, SDA is the primary lance. With this vehicle sitting right here on the... Uh, actually, I'll go through the counters in a second. So we've got SD broken up into two lances. Dragon's Rejects are broken up into two, two lances. Lances. We've got our SP artillery on the on the map board. We have our, our first Astrakhazi militia up here. So I'm just going to take you through a quick uh, overview of what, um, like how things will kind of show up as we're doing. This is kind of where the rules are at at this moment. They might change, but it at least will give you an idea. Okay, so Dragon's Rejects, like, let's look at them first. So this is uh, the main unit, the Dragon's Rejects A. And I decided to, um, we're talking about using baggage trains. And the baggage train is basically your... Uh, repair your medical facilities, all that kind of stuff, because we've been talking about how we can implement that into the game. So, um, if you're only operating one unit and, and you don't want to have an extra lance and stuff, which is perfectly fine, you don't have to have multiple lances, um, you can operate them just this way. So, uh, you'd have the DR with no A, um, and then your rough estimate of skull, um, what you what the uh, lance you figure can take on. This is just for your... your um, I mean, you guys know this already, for your allies to know roughly if you're going to be in trouble or not where you're sitting, right? So this is a 3.5 skull uh, lance. The uh, the vehicle right here denotes that this is where the baggage train is currently residing. So I, just, I was going to make it its own counter, and then I'm like, you know, for the most part, it's going to be traveling with your main unit no matter what you do. Like, you can separate it if you want and have it retreat so it's not in the battle. Um... But the baggage train being with your main unit allows you to do almost instantaneous repairs, almost instantaneous um, healing for your pilots. You don't have to take a turn shipping them back to where your baggage train is and bringing them forward. The only problem that you're going to have is if you have multiple lances. So you can only have one baggage train. So at that point, depending on how far apart your lances are, you may want to have it break apart from your unit and sit somewhere on the map board. And that way, if this unit needs it, it can get there quickly. If this unit needs it, it can get there quickly. You know, it's got a movement of three, so you could have your units spread apart by like almost seven hexes if you wanted to and have it sitting in the center and have it go to either one if you need to. That's just an option. For the most part, I'm thinking that it's going to be stuck with one of your units, most likely. Um, and if this unit needed it, it could kind of move over and occupy the hex with this unit and, and, and have access to it. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. So the baggage train icon will show up on whichever unit you want to have it show up on. Uh, it can transfer from one to another too as well. It doesn't really matter. Then we have the numbers at the bottom here. The two is your movement value on the map board. So these guys can only move two hexes. The three is your detection range. Um, this includes if you have a beagle active, active probe or not. Uh, actually, this is written in wrong. I have to fix that. But... Um, so for this, it's got a movement of two, it's got a hex detection range of three, which means it can see up to three hexes. And the minus one means that uh, at least half of the unit has Guardian ECM, so it subtracts one off of en enemy sensor detection, which is good because, I mean, I can only move two, and if an enemy was three hex away, I wouldn't be able to attack it. I'd be able to see it, but I wouldn't be able to attack it. And if he could move three, but only has the sensors of three, it would subtract one, so he would only have a sensors of two, so he wouldn't be able to see me. Meaning, I could keep going in a, on a, in a different direction, and he would never see me. Now, you don't know if these units will have active probes or not. Most units higher, like medium medium units or higher, probably won't have active probes. It'll mostly be the lights and the scout units that have them. But, um, yeah, so if he doesn't detect you, he doesn't detect you, right? At least that will allow you to kind of have a bit of uh, movement and maneuver if you want. Now, you notice here that the um, static defense has a four for its detection range, and that's because it has a Beagle active probe actively uh, working. So it can see mechs up to four hexes away. So this guy will see the same units that this guy will see out to here. Um, 
And that's why, I mean, you, I can bring this guy up along behind him and he'll be able to see all the units that this guy can see. Now, as far as Fog of War goes, we're going to be revealing that um, as we go. So this particular map board, um, even though we can see all the units currently, what we're going to end up doing is there'll be a Fog of War, much like you were playing with, um, and that is a hidden, no, it's not a hidden lair. Um, much like we had with the... Um, battle for Lhasa all you're gonna see is this right and it, it won't be until enemies are within your sensor range like currently we've been doing it as sectors so if an enemy moves into the sector you spot them in this case uh, because we're all ground units there's no air, air units scouting uh, because you're all ground units you're only gonna be able to see the units that are in your sensor range so you're really not gonna have an idea of what's here until you get there uh, that way it leaves question marks across the map board um, and as you move, you'll, like, units will reveal themselves, but that doesn't necessarily mean, like if you pick up a scout here, that doesn't necessarily mean that like, there's no units here. You know what I mean? There could be three medium units waiting. Someone preys on the scout, and then the three units take them out. So you have to be very, very careful moving forward and how you're going to advance. Um, so lighter, lighter, faster units you probably want up front. Um, the heavier, slower units you bring up the rear. Um, just so that they don't get jumped. But anyway, um, that we can work out as we're going along. So let's get back here really quickly, take a look at these counters again. Yeah, I went too far, there we go. We're still working this out. Um, hopefully this, uh, the battle for Ashurkazi will be, uh, there'll be another uh, video for that up this weekend. Okay, so that's the, that's the counter. It's pretty simple, right? It's, I mean, I've got a certain number of mech icons, so uh, I can show you that before we start. Uh, before I make counters for everybody and you guys can decide what you want like this is a vindicator you know this is an urban mech um, I can't remember if this is a I think this is a Highlander might be I can't remember um, I have no I can't remember what this is either enforcer no not enforcer something anyway um, yeah I've got limited numbers so you guys can just choose which one you want um, in this playthrough for um, that I'm going to be doing for Battle of Astrakhazi. There's a few, there's a few other units on the board. I have some self-propelled artillery. I have got a convoy. This is a supply convoy for me, um, because of the mechs that I had basically sold off out of my thing. I kept tabs of what I had. I had was able to make um, a couple of medium lances and some light lances. So we're going to be running these guys as well. We got light lances here. A light lance can move four hexes. A medium lance can move three. Uh, this has got a Beagle Active Probe, so there's a detection of four. So I got my light, light lances out front here. Um, they're going to be scouting for the enemy um, before my main lances get into play. And I'm, I'm just going to be marching these guys forward. Most likely these vehicles will stay be further behind. SPR, SPAA is capturable, or sorry, self-propelled artillery is capturable uh, with, with zero defense. So if, it's, if it gets attacked by a light unit, the enemies can capture it. This is uh, basically a three skull battle. The enemies have to pull off against my unit. Um, I'm still working on how that will apply in the game, but most likely this, this unit will never get in combat anyway. Uh, and I do have light lances um, made now for these guys. So if these guys get into combat, I'm able to, to run the combat for these guys. But yeah, so you know, basically what will happen is it'll be your movement turn. So all players will move first. Um, and nothing will happen until the movement ends. Then on phase two, all of the enemies will be revealed. So on your movement turn, if you've already if you already see enemies and wish to attack them, you may go ahead and do so. Attacking ends your turn. So, um, for instance, let's say let's just go with the light unit for now. Let's say we're going to be um, moving forward to attack this guy. Let's just say this guy's here for the sake of argument. Uh, so the Light Lance wanted to move forward and attack this guy. It's got a movement of four, so it goes, it moves its full four, one, two, three, and then one for attack, which is four. Um, if it defeats this unit, it can end up moving into this hex, taking the hex, or you can choose to stay here. Um, you can choose to stay in this hex, uh, and as per zone of control rules, you can choose to hug this hex if you want. Um, basically, this basically um, says that you're in, inflict like enforcing a zone of control on this hex so that when you have movement again um, you can attack a unit that goes by here for one movement point 
it's going to end your turn, but you have the ability to do that. So zone of control is really going to be situational. It's like it's mostly designed for static defense if the enemy's moving into it, like a large numbers of large numbers of enemies are moving in to attack you. Um, you may want to turtle up and do some zone of controls so you can take a target of opportunity as it tries to go by you. Um, you have to save a movement point for that, but and it'll end your turn if you attack them. But at least it gives you an option to attack a unit if it's trying to flank you. Um, the little dot here on the side, uh, you'll begin to notice um, as we're going along that some of these units here um, have more than one dot. You can't really see them here, but I'll just zoom in a little bit. Yeah, maybe not that far. Um, the mobile units on the map board are going to have dots. Most of them will just be a single dot, just denotes the fact that it's just a lance. They can have up to three, meaning it's a full company, but it also means three battles. So every dot means it's it's a one battle's worth of mechs. It, I mean, it's hard to denote that it's like one lance, two lance, three lances, because you're obviously fighting more than one lance almost every battle you, you play, but it, it's the number of battles that this unit has in it. So this unit has two battles. So if you move forward and attack it, you do one battle's worth, and most likely it will attack you the next turn for one battle's worth as a counterattack. How we're going to run that, and this is what gives the enemy... Like, we have to give the enemy at least a fighting chance. After the after the Battle of Lhasa, doesn't matter. Even if they had death stacks, they didn't have a fighting chance. This way, if you're engaging a unit like this, and, and you may encounter multiple of, them, multiples of them side by side. If you attack one, you destroy one of these... Uh, bubbles it can attack you again next turn but the thing is on, on on its attack phase but if you use your attack phase to attack it and then it attacks you you're fighting two battles back to back and you cannot heal between those two battles so once you're the battle is played you're not allowed to advance your timeline or heal your pilots or any of that stuff they have to go into the second battle fatigue giving them an opportunity to get wounded so this is going to mean you're going to have to coordinate with your players. You're going to have to be careful about who you're attacking. Um, plus, there might be more than one enemy on the hex, like down here, and they might have more than one um, skull each. So you're going to have to coordinate attacks. Um, these enemies can split off, so one lance can go this way, one lance can go this way. They'll split up and move around. Um, unfortunately, the heavies can't join with the mediums. Um, so the heavy has to operate on its own. It can still occupy this hex with the medium. Um, but we're, what, what I'm going to do is that like, I'm going to say that positioning matters. So if there's a heavy unit in this hex and a medium, like, let's go over here and take a look at this one. This is probably a little better. So we've got, a, we've got two heavy units and an assault unit in this hex. The assault unit is sitting in the center of the hex. The only way that you can attack this assault unit is that if you if you attack it from the north or here or here right because you have clear access to it if you were to come through here the two heavies could easily block you off you can't come through here because the heavy's there you can't come through here because the heavy's there so whichever unit is in front is the unit you need to attack first um, meaning you can't take this spaa unit simply by moving into the hex you got to defeat this unit first and then you have an opportunity to grab it um, they'll still counterattack you but i mean it, me it just means that you don't have to fight all of the units in the hex to go after something that's in the center. Positioning will matter. Now you'll notice too that some of these gun batteries aren't set up straight on a hex. They're on a conjunction of three hexes. All gun batteries, um, all, like all base defense missions, um, have a zone of control. So this unit being here on all, th like on the corner of all three hexes has a zone of control over three these three hexes, meaning if you intend to pass by this unit on one of these hexes, this unit can elect to force you into combat. If it survives, like if you don't destroy this unit and it survives and you and like and you lose and you attempt to continue moving along, it will attack you again. Um, you can reduce its skull value based on how much damage you do to it, but this is basically the skull rating of the battle. Um, they're just fixed emplacements. And some of them will be straddling hexes like this, meaning it just has a zone of control above and below it not in the, in the hex in front of it. Um, it will all, once again, it'll just all be situational depending on like, you know, where the enemy is set up. Uh, also, if we go to, actually let's go to, uh, where are you here? Northern Lance, here we go. So here's the Night Gaunts. 
Um, these guys are a little different. They're in clan mechs, so the mechs are most of them are actually relatively fast. Um, most of them have a 5-8 movement. So their movement is three, even though they've got a lot of heavier mechs. Um, this guy has a Beagle Actor probe. But you'll notice the scout lance here, this guy here. The It's a light lance, right? The Beagle Active Probe, and it's got minus one. So if you see a unit with a minus one on the corner or whatever the minus ends up being, that's the unit's stealth. There's going to be a very rare, very, very rare occasions where you'll get a, a minus two, and that's if every unit in the, um, every uh, mech in the actual unit has um, a Guardian ECM or half of them have stealth armor. If the if the entire unit has got stealth armor, which is hard to do for the enemy because, I mean, let's face it, you're attacking the enemy and like oh, they almost never have stealth armor. So um, it would be a minus three if they have stealth armor, which means unless you have a Beagle active probe, you're basically, you have to be on top of them on the, in the actual hex to see them. Then it's an ambush, they ambush you and you're screwed, right? So there's never gonna be an assault unit that's gonna have minus three stealth. Let's face it, it's just not gonna happen. Um, but there might be medium units on the board that are that have that minus three and that can also be from them being completely shut down so if you're worried about being detected you can shut your unit completely down everything basically turns off and your your detection becomes minus three meaning the enemy has to stumble upon your hex or be next to you with a beagle active probe to, to detect you and that's if you're doing repairs and stuff well if you're doing repairs you can't actually shut down you actually have to have stuff working which means they're going to spot you but if you don't want to do anything for your turn, you can just turn everybody off and you can sit there with minus three stealth. The enemy won't see you. Um, it still means you need to spend a, like a, a one, one movement point to fire everybody back up again to move the next turn. But at least you can turn yourself off. And some of the enemies might be that way. They may be like you may f encounter a couple of medium lances um, that have got that have shut themselves down and are hiding. So you may not actually pick them up until it's too late. Most of those things will be like if they're in like a town or a, on a control point or something like that, they may all shut themselves off. So as you're approaching a control point, you may only see the guns, um, like the defensive battery for the control point, um, and not know how many mechs are there. And then you got to like move up a scout unit, somebody who's got some like Beagle Active Probe, to move up and just to be able to pick up what enemies are there or at least pass by them. So movement's going to be important. Um, and stealth and guardians are going to like guardian ECM is going to be important. At least trying to make sure one of your units has a beagle active probe is going to be important uh, to get that extra detection on the enemy. Most of the enemies will not have beagle active probes. It'll only be their scout and light lances that do for the most part. Um, so as long as your unit has a beagle active probe, you'll have a one up on the enemy and you won't get yourself into a lot of trouble. And also too, just keep in mind, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to set it up so that the enemy is going to steamroll you like you're not going to show up in a hex and you're not going to be surrounded by like eight medium units you know what i mean that are all just going to dogpile and kill you it's just not going to happen that way um but it, once again it's going to depend on how tightly packed you are in the last battle in the last um playthrough the battle of lassa or the current one that we're doing um you have to group up right grouping up is beneficial because they've got death stacks in this game there's really no death stacks um it's going to allow for more realistic uh, movement, spreading out your units. Um, and as far as like, joining and separating units, I, I know it's been mentioned. I don't know if you guys have, have gone to the uh, rules and read them, but um, you can bring your lances together for, for combat. So if you've got more than one, one lance, let's say, like both of these guys are going to be operating with, this is the Dragon Redrax, so five mechs each. Um, if I need to crack an assault unit, I'm not going to attack it with one of these guys and attack it with another guy and hope hope I win. I can bring these two lances together so he would move to here, he would move to here, right? They would join together and attack the unit in the next hex, right? Because they've got two movement, one movement, one movement, and then together and attack these guys, right? So they'll join together and, and attack as one unit. That expends both their movement points and it expends their attack for the turn, but then I can, I can bring them together to go after an assault unit, right? And then... When we're back facing like lighter units or you want to do some cleanup you can split your units up and move them off so if you've got a like if you've got a, a unit of fast mechs like for instance the um, static defense this primary unit here has eight urban mechs in it right and it's got vehicles this lance here just has three mechs in it that are relatively fast that's it it's only got three mechs 
I haven't updated the the, uh, the, the card here yet, but um, it just has three mechs. Now this unit can join with this one if it wants to. Then I have to decide, because I can only drop eight mechs in a fight, I have to decide which mechs I'm going to use in that fight. But I have the option to bring this unit into these guys and then choose from the 11 mechs that I have who I want to bring into the battle, right? So if I'm going to be fighting a tougher battle, I'm better off joining my units to do that. Um, so yeah, and I mean, you can split units up, up, up apart and use a unit as a scout lance if you want. So this way it kind of rewards you for having um, multiple weight class mechs. So heavy units are obviously going to move two, um, two or three hexes. Like if your movement is three, five, for your mechs, like the slowest movement, I mean, you can just read it all in the rules. Your movement points are two. If you're averaging four, six, your movement points are three. Um, if you're averaging five, eight, your movement points are four. Anything above five, eight is four. It doesn't matter how fast you are. It's always going to be four. And the enemies are the same. Their scout units and light lances are moving four. The mediums are moving three. And the heavy assaults are moving two. So it keeps it fair. Um, you're not going to get like run down by an assault lance, for instance. It's not going to be a movement movement of four assault lance that's going to run you over. That just that will never happen. Um, and if you want to outrun an assault lance, you can obviously do that with pretty much anybody. As long as you stay away from them, they're not going to be able to attack you, right? Uh, but if you do have a heavier lance, they can run you down with medium lances. They can group up three or four medium lances and run you down and do consecutive attacks and wear you out and kill you. So that's the other thing you have to be aware of too. Uh, it won't be like a one single five skull attack. It will be like if they if they attack your like if they attack decide to attack this guy with uh, three medium units. I have to run three battles back to back without resting my pilots. So not a, like you may have armor repair between battles and stuff, but um, your component repair won't be there, which means you could have mechs going into battle with with damaged components, or you could be over, you could have lost mechs and be missing mechs for the next battle or have pilots injured and have to decide whether you're going to put them into battle or not. Um, but you could end up with three battles back to back if they decide to chase you down. So those are the things you have to be aware of. Stay, you know, you're going to want team teammates around you. And once again, if there's more than like, you can have more than one unit in a hex. So there may be three players in this hex, in which case, if there's three lances here, they'll attack each one individually. Um, they won't all go for the same unit. That just won't happen. Uh, they'll attack each unit individually. So there is strength in numbers, um, but it also works on their side too because they can do multiple attacks against one unit. Or so if they've got, if so, if they've got six units here, and you've got three. They can do double attacks against all three of them. So it's just you know, it, it should be a little bit more challenging, I think, for the second playthrough. I mean, obviously, there's going to be things that we're going to adjust. Uh, the second playthrough, we're not going to start off with artillery or, or aircraft. Uh, we'll leave those out and keep them as optional rules for now just so we can get the ground combat working properly and then we can work on introducing rules as we as we go like scenario wise so i think that's pretty much all i want to talk to you about in this one i would suggest going to the discord uh channel with the rules in it and have a look at them they will be continually being revised i may have said a few things here that i don't have in the rules currently um but we'll see how it goes. Uh, like obviously, I'm trying to limit the amount of counters on the on the map board, which is why I went to the multiple lances idea, one to th one two three. So rather than having like three units sitting in this hex, we've got one with two with three bubbles on it. It'll save space. Um, and that's about it. We've got the dropships and aircraft and stuff in here currently on this map, but they won't be on the one that we're doing. Um, yeah, I think that's about all I want to talk about. I mean, I mentioned about the, the convoys are in the rules, how they're basically a, a fixed skull size of convoy. You can choose what size of how much of the convoy you want to attack. Um, as per the old rules, I, I figured that's the best way to run convoys um, because you can choose how much of it you want to attack and then next turn they've got a move of three, so they'll just take off. Um, and it's fixed regardless of how heavy they, they, are, they are here. It's a fixed movement of three. They can't go faster or slower, so it'll just be a fixed movement. Um, SPAA has got a fixed movement. Uh, I think that's it. So there won't, there shouldn't be any surprises. The only surprises that you'll probably have are when um, 
when the enemy uh, surprises you because they've um, got units that are turned off in a hex or you may stumble over a hill with, a, with uh, one of your forward observers and discover a whole bunch of units sitting there. Uh, that's always a surprise. Um, but once again, like I said, I'm going to keep it fair. I'm not going to like dogpile that unit or whatever. It won't be like a target of opportunity. A target of opportunity. It'll be... Think of it this way. Like, if you encountered a scout unit here, yeah, you could rush to, you could rush to attack it. But the thing is, is you don't know what's beyond that, right? So you moving up to attack this guy could reveal three units here and then you're dead, right? So the enemy is going to be functioning in much the same manner. So if you move forward and you discover three enemy units, they're not all going to rush to attack you. They have to, they have to decide what they're going to do that turn. Most likely one unit will engage you to find out your strength. The other ones will attempt to flank because they don't know if they've got, if you've got people behind you, right? Unless they've got an active probe and can see your allies and kind of have an idea of what's behind you, they will not move forward to engage you necessarily, right? Um, they're going to take into consideration only what they can see. So it'll, I'll, be, I'll run the enemy or whoever ends up refereeing it, because I'm hoping in the future some other people might take over refereeing as well. Um, but whoever is refereeing it can only go after the, like will only um, use the, the enemy against what they can see and not go, oh, I know there's more players back there, so I'm going to move the Light Lance directly into where they all are. you got to just take into account of the battlefield, the terrain, what you're going to be doing and things like that, right? So um, you'll also notice on the map board, I've updated the, uh, the uh, hex designations. It does loop at a certain point. The, num like the letters and numbers will loop. It only goes to T and then it goes back to A. But it's irrelevant because you're only moving three hexes. It's plenty to uh, designate where your like what your path will be. Um, what other thing? Oh yeah, also uh, tricks for movement. If you're here and an enemy unit is here, you can move here and then attack here to reveal possibility for other enemies down here, right? So it, it is kind of a trick movement. I and mean, as long as he's not, as long as this unit is not doesn't have a zone of control, you can kind of move and then move and then attack if you want and then stay in this hex so you're actually here as opposed to attacking and moving into this hex. Uh, but it will also reveal three hexes down here so you'll get a little bit more sight of the map. Um, and I will, be I will be taking all that into account. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, ideally what we would do is move one, one hex and then reveal stuff, move two hex, then reveal stuff. Uh, we're not going to do it that way. We're going to do your full move, and then I'll reveal what you can currently see or what you have passed and seen. So, for instance, if this light, light mech moves here, 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 and here, um, it will, I will reveal whatever it has seen as it went by. So it may end up over here, but it would still be able to see something down here because it's passed through a hex there. And if there was a mech down here, it would detect it. So you would, be, you would, end, up, you would end your move here, but then a unit would show up down here. Then the following move, when you go to like on their turn, because you can't see that unit, there's nobody in range of that unit at this point. Like let's say there's nobody at range, this unit would disappear all of a sudden on their turn, and they would make their move. And then what you would see on their move is only the the, the like their mechs and stuff that are within your sensor range. So any moves that they move into your sensor range that that would show up. Um, I know this is long-winded and stuff, but once it starts, once you start actually playing, I got a feeling it's, it's just going to go quickly. Like there's going to be a lot of fog of war. You're not going to be able to know where the enemy is most of the time. You're going to be guessing. They're going to be guessing where you are most of the time. They're not going to, like once, like if they detect a heavy unit down here, they're not necessarily going to commit these heavy assets to go after that one unit because they have no idea. Like you could have three assault lances up here and they'd have no idea. So they're going to play based on what they can see, right? Um, and I'll, and I'll, as a referee who, or whoever is refereeing, just stay as honest as possible. That's all I can recommend. I was trying to do the same thing with the Leal forces with the Battle of Lhasa. Just kind of go with what they kind of know as information. Um, and I did their movements. Like I would plan a couple turns ahead and say, okay, th these are their goals for this turn, what they want to do, right? So, and I would just apply those, those goals and go based off of what they encountered as they were going along. 
but still try and stay true to their goals, right? So um, it, it will be the same with these guys. They're gonna trace, stay true to their goals. Like, um, so maintaining and keeping the points, if you take it, most likely they will muster together a counterattack to go after you, um, depending on what they know is there. So if four units attack this, they don't really have enough units to take those four units. They're gonna, they're gonna turtle and go defensive. They're not just gonna throw units against you. Uh, but if they only if they only know one unit is here, they may gather up a a force to come after you, the one unit. But you may have had like two or three units back here hiding, which then might move forward. They which they don't know are there. They'll continue their their movement forward because they haven't seen them, right? And then as they get there, they're like, oh shit, there's like four units here now. Now we have to either retreat or defend ourselves or whatever. So that's what that's how it'll happen. Um, and they'll only basically go against what they feel they can fight. So a light mech or a scout unit is not going to attack a heavy unit. They're going to retreat. They're going to stay out of your range. Most likely, they'll they'll stay at least four with a beagle active probe. They'll stay at least four hexes away, um, and at least have a detection. Or they might back up to and wait for you to move forward into their detection again, and just stay out of your range. Which is why you probably want to have uh, some people running lighter lances. So that they can actually move forward. You may might might not want to go all the way forward and attack this guy. You may want to move forward too and see what you can spot and see if this guy is actually a target of opportunity or not, right? Move forward and, and take him out. Um, so yeah, it's all gonna depend on that. It's I, I think I'm hoping that the detection, the beagle active probes, and the stealth add a little bit of a dynamic to the game. I think that's kind of needed. Um, especially with the new movement values, not everybody's moving at the same speed. So your heavier units, you're going to want to at least have some Guardian on them so they can get within strike range of, of medium units. Otherwise, you're just not going to, like, if the medium unit, can, can you see you three hexes away, they can just keep moving two and stay out of your range. But if they can't see you, if you've got, if you've got your minus one, they've got to be, like, within two hexes, then you're in strike range, right? And it becomes a problem for them. They'll never know where you are. So they either have to, either, they'll either have to fully retreat or commit to a fight. Um, yeah, and like, it's also interesting too because it, it, it also allows you, if you want, to build a fully stealth out, like NSS stealth uh, unit of like, if you can get four NSSs, build a full NSS stealth unit and travel around the map board with, under full NSS stealth um, trying to take as many of the enemies down as possible. So it's going to reward you for building units that are very stealthy, um, but it can also punish you. Like once they detect where you are on the map board, they're not going to let a stealth unit just won't roam around. So they will attempt to, to, to kill your unit because that's a, it's a serious threat to, to their survivability. So they will attempt to kill your unit if it is fully stealthed out. Um, so you can turn, you can choose to turn that stealth off and be revealed again and become less stealthy. But you know, when you're fully stealth, it just becomes very dangerous for them. So, um, and if it if it gets out of control, if like if all the players are running full stealth, then um, I'll have to take some, uh, or the referee will have to take some um, uh, enemy liberties to try and counteract that. Uh, whether they end up with more light units or scout units with beagle active probes and stuff to kind of to uh, sniff you out before you get to their main units um, it will also like they'll they may end up with two or three extra scout units to basically sniff you out so that they can at least find out where you are and set up a trap for you right um, so yeah I'm hoping that we can get at least a couple of ambushes going uh, on our side and on their side too just to kind of spice things up in the next fights um, make things a little challenging I'm hoping that everybody can at least engage. Uh, it's not going to happen every turn. Uh, realistically, I, I mean, optimistically, originally, I wanted to try and give everybody something to do every turn where they were, you know, you're doing fighting and stuff like that. Um, but I'm hoping the turns will play out a little faster, uh, especially on, on turns that we're just moving up, moving up and detecting the enemy. Those might actually happen in one, one quick day. So if we can get um, strategy like on the Discord strategy and planning, what the intended goal is. So even if someone doesn't necessarily report, can't report in every single day, uh, we know what the movement is, so we can move their, their counter forward. 
um, and have quick movement until we get into combat and then the turns can slow down a bit. Because there's going to be those turns where it's like, and, and we, we're discovering that now with the Battle of Lassa 2, where there's movement turns, right? Everyone's jockeying for position, but no fighting. Uh, most likely that's going to happen in this as well. You're going to be jockeying for position, trying to set up to get ready to, to, to move in and assault the enemy. Um, and hopefully those turns can go by real quick and then we can get into the fighting again. Um, otherwise, it's just going to be a grand melee and everyone's just going to be like ridiculous to the fighting. But the size of this map board right now, this is a little big. Um, just because I, I'm, I, I want to test a few things um, as I'm doing my um, Battle for Astrakhazi playthrough, what, which is what this map board is actually set up for. Um, so a lot of the movement, you're, you guys aren't going to see. It's all going to be behind the scenes, and you'll just see the updated counters on the board when we've all moved forward and roughly engaged the enemy and where they've gone and all that kind of stuff. So it'll be a, a it'll be a fictional battle, but it's just really I want to test out, you know, how this is going to work out or not. But for the most part, like when we start the battles, you guys would probably start more along this line here, and the enemy the enemy might be over here, so at least like four or five hexes away. So on those first couple moves, it's basically sniffing out the enemy, and then we're into combat, right? And hopefully the combat continues right to the very end of the battle. So. Yeah, if you have any ideas, please drop them in the comments section. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I know I opened the uh, the um, the rules on a uh, Google Doc. So if you guys have any suggestions, feel free to go into the Google Doc. At the bottom, there's like, uh, I've got an area where it's like I'm working on kind of rules um, or possible rules or just thoughts behind some of the rules. Um, so just... You know, feel free to drop them in the comments down there or in the comments of this video. Uh, whatever you want to do, just, just drop it in the comments section. And um, we can work on streamlining these even more. Uh, maybe we need to increase the speed a little bit. Uh, my only concern is the map board is, is not very big. So the more, like the more um, the, the, the units can move, yes, the more combat will actually happen. But the faster you move too, um, the easier it is to get surrounded by the enemy and killed. So if you, like for instance, if you have medium mechs moving five, unless you're moving as a wall of mechs, the enemy is just going to surround you and kill you because they can move five as well and they'll just, after you move, they move and, they, and it's, you're just done, right? So um, I, I'm trying to keep it to a reasonable two, three, four, I think it's probably pretty reasonable. Um, as far as turn times go, I've stayed away from time and distance and we're just going with turns. So for the Battle of Lhasa, I always saw that the, that one turn equaled one day, like one full turn equaled one day. Uh, so for larger battles, that could be the case. Um, and the, the turn is just basically like the hex does it. Uh, you can argue that the distance does matter for the hex. Um, like if it's if this is 10 kilometers, let's say, then the artillery might be able to fire across the map board. If this is 100 kilometers, obviously it's not. It's only going to fire a couple hexes. But I think counter-wise, I think uh, and game mechanic-wise, realistically, um, the time frame is basically dictates the size of the hex. And I don't think the size of the hex really makes all that much difference, like distance-wise. I mean, you could argue it does because if it's a 100 kilometer hex, you could fit a hell of a lot of units in there. Um, but for me, it's just the, I think time dictates the hex distance. So for instance, if we're playing a very like a very short or small scenario um, where it's not like a grand, like it, we could be just attacking a city, let's say, then the, the we've still got the same movement but the turns might only be 20 minutes, like quote unquote 20 minutes in length uh, or an hour in length. Um, but in an hour, you, that's how far you would move. And in this case, this is a much larger map board. So this could be like a one hour turn where it takes an hour to move a couple of hexes to get up here to, to the enemy. Who knows? It's all, it's all gonna be like, I think the hexes size should be time-based, but I mean, then the argument becomes, well, you'd never be able to fix, put a fusion core in a mech in, in a 20 minute turn or a one hour turn. You might be able to do it in a four hour, eight hour, 24 hour turn. 
Yeah, and we can adjust the rules based on each campaign and each scenario we play. Um, the amount of repairs you can do might be dictated by the size of the campaign. So the smaller means less or no repairs. Bigger campaign means more and more intricate repairs as you're going along. Um, but then that will also be reflected in the number of enemies you face. So a smaller campaign, you're not facing as many enemies. You might only engage in, let's say, three or four battles until, the, until that scenario is over. Whereas a bigger campaign, there might be up to 20 or 30 battles, which is a, like a, a hugely different scenario, right? Where you'd have time between the battles to actually repair your guys, whereas the other one, you won't have time. So, yeah. I mean, it's all going to depend on what you guys want to do. Um, we can have multiple scenarios going at the same time, too. It's not a big deal. And this may seem like a lot of work um, on my end of things. I'm, I'm finding it a little difficult running um, missions while um, being a referee on the board. Um, but I don't mind just, rel like, like just going to being the referee and updating the maps and stuff like that and coming up with scenarios and running the scenarios. I have no problem with that because this stuff, once this is built, like it looks really complicated and hard. But honestly, once it's built, like once the scenario is built, the map is built, the um, uh, where you're going is built. Once that, once that's all done, like this, like doing this part of it is like ridiculously easy. Like for me to update the maps and stuff, it's just a matter of grabbing the counter, moving it to where it goes, right on the map board, and then pumping out a uh, JPEG, which takes like two seconds. Like. You know, there's my JPEG, render it done, right? So it's it's so easy to update the maps for me and keep track of what everybody's doing. <clears throat> it's a little harder when I'm trying to run my lance on my own and trying to do Battle for Astrakhazi content and trying to do Darkness Falls content. <laughs> um, Darkness Falls is going to probably slip off until... It, until uh, Alpha, like once I'm finished that series, it'll probably slip away until Alpha 20 comes out. Then I'll probably get back another series for that one. I'll be just mostly doing Battletech stuff here, but um, yeah, but like now that it, now that this is built, the battle for Astakazi is just going to be running the missions, and it'll be the same thing. Like if I'm refereeing uh, the battles for this, it's it's easy, right? Uh, it's easy to update the maps um, now that everything's on the map and and the idea behind the scenario is written. It's just easy to run it, so I'm not worried about that. Uh, but running lances might become a little tricky. So especially, you know, I, I foolishly put in the uh, battalion supply and HQ um, as potential units because I was hoping to run some missions myself and and stuff. And I'm discovering that 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 I probably should have left those two out um, of the scenario and let it run the way it ran. Um, I don't mind running Conrad's commandos; that that's fine. But uh, having those extra two lances for me was a little bit too much. So um, I think for like following scenarios, those two will be will kind of be backups. So if if you need additional support or whatever on, in a specific scenario, they'll be available to use. Other than that, they'll most likely just you know sit there as as uh, reserves. So um, or they might end up at the back of a map board here, like you know as a as a CNC function. They're one they're the ones running the communications to everybody. Uh, so the commander relays the communications to CNC, and then it goes out to everybody else. Um, that's all it would be. And then if they're needed, they can move forward and help out. But like other than that, they'll just probably sit and do nothing for most of the battles. Um, yeah, and I think that's probably after all that uh, gaseous expulsion there of uh, long-windedness. I think that's probably all I want to talk about in this one. I'm sure there's stuff I missed, but yeah, go check it out. Uh, go to the Discord. Go to, I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen it. The uh, the up came, uh, the revised campaign rules as a Google Doc. Uh, I've got it saved on my desktop, so if shit happens to it, I can always just copy and paste it back in. I always do changes on my desktop first, then update that doc. So if somehow you guys fuck it up while it's there, um, then I can just replace it. It's easy enough. Um, so don't feel bad if you add stuff at the bottom. If you do add stuff at the bottom, um, I will... Um, basically copy and paste it out of there and add it into my document. So um, that should be saved as well unless something happens between when I see it and when you guys do it. 
And I'm continuing to ramble on. So I'm going to end this here. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, yeah, please drop comments in the comment section or go to the Google Doc and uh, make comments on the rules there. Um, yeah. Until next time. See you later.